Um, what? Lancero is obviously your favorite size. Yes. Is there, is there a size that you like that you currently don't make that you're thinking about making? Because I'm a Corona Corda whore. I think everybody on, online knows that. That's my favorite size cigar. I love that size cigar. It's, it's, to me, it's one of the perfect size cigars, yes. especially if you're blending. Yeah. Um, when we did the Sudeste, that was the one size that I had rolled mm -hmm. that I could smoke and say, no, yes, change this, change that. A lot of people don't make that size anymore. I mean, honestly, there's a lot of people that the Panatella, the Lonsdale, yeah. those are sizes that I think the Corona Gorda is a very popular size. Yeah. When we have them in certain brands, people buy them. Mm -hmm. However, a lot of manufacturers don't make them. Is there a size, whether it's a 6x60, a Corona Gorda, a Panatella, is there a size that you want to make that you just haven't yet, or you've had a lot of requests for? Well, if, if the Selección line, I, I tried different things with that. If you see it, it doesn't have the same Vitolas um, on the bigger ring gauge as my Sangro and my Oscuro and my Classico. That was the only line that I was, I, was, I tried to do different sizes. I, that was the first um, uh, blend that I did a 60 ring gauge. More because I was getting a lot of requests for a 60 ring gauge on the Sangro and the Oscuro. Um, and I said, you know, I don't want to do that with the Sangro and the Oscuro yet. Doesn't mean I won't do it eventually, but right now I didn't want to do it. Maybe let me introduce it with a new blend and see how it goes. Um, so if you if you want six degree engaged Pinata Rio, you only will find it in the Selección line, and that's a sixty by five, uh, five by sixty. Uh, I was, also have a double toro. Um, if you if you see it um, in here. It's uh, again, it's a seven and a half, you know, by uh, 54, uh, you know, 52 actually, and that's the only, the only two Vitola sizes that I introduced new uh, on the Selección line. I do have a Corona Gorda in the in the in the classical. Why do not have those? Do you have those? <laughs> do I have those? Excellent. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, I do. Yes. <laughs> That's the only. I only have Corona going in the classical. So I try to have like every blend to have maybe one or two vitolas that you won't find in the other blends. Uh, I don't want to normalize every blend that I'm, I'm producing. Sure. Tell us a little bit about uh, of the history of Pinar del Rio. How long you've been in the business? How long the company's existed? You know, and, and I, I'm sure in the cigar business, you know, it's always when you have a new manufacturer. Mm -hmm. It's always a struggle to compete with the big guys. To just give our, our viewers a little bit of a history about where you came from industry-wise, Pinar del Rio, and where you're at today, and, and maybe something that you've got planned in the future that you may want to talk about a little bit, new cigar, new blend, or something. Well, um, Pinar del Rio has been around for two years, two and a half years now. Uh, the factory has been around for seven years. Uh, the factory is in Tamburo, it's called Don Liencio. Um, my family is from a region of the Dominican Republic called Bonao. It's in the Cibao. My grandfather grew, uh, we were farmers, mostly growing coffee and some tobacco. Um, and we actually grew tobacco, this is tobacco called Anduyo, and that's what we grew a lot. Um, if that was the only tobacco we did. Uh, had a lot of family members who worked in different factories, and I helped them out with like, some blending and some creative work and some um, some packaging uh, aspects on how to develop some of those cigars, but they never panned out. It was uh, only went to the European market or small, couple small retailers in the United States. Um, but Juan, who's my partner, always had a factory. Always has been there. His his family and his brothers were rollers for Davidoff, uh, Fuente, uh, Manolo Quesada. For for 15 to 20 to 25 years, they worked there forever. They came to the United States uh, during the boom uh, and settled in New Orleans um, and made their money. Having they had a little little rolling factory in New Orleans and uh, that became really big. And, that, and with that money, they opened up their factory in the Dominican Republic. I partnered up with them about two and a half years ago after I left my previous employer because I wanted to develop my own line. Now how Pinata Hill came about was um, there was this, this is grower in the Republic, his name is Leo Reyes. Um, he's in Navarrete. All his seeds, or the Habano seeds that he used for Habano, the Habano wrapper, and Habano, Habano with Arriba, Habano with Tabajo, all the, the fillers that he has, 
come from Pinar del Rio. So when I started developing the project with Wang and I bought into a portion of the factory and we divided everything equally and everything, we had no name for the blends that we were com coming up with. Um, I was over there uh, in, in, the, in the farm just pulling out from, from Pacas and just sitting there where we were just coming up with different blends. And every blend that I was developing, I was putting a little little band on it and saying, uh, United Rio, Liga Cubana, one, Liga Cubana, two, because the sacks of seeds and the sacks that he had had uh, United Rio everywhere. <laughs> so that name was coming up to me, it was hitting me all the time. So, and I wanted something all Cubano. When I say all Cubano, it means all Cuban seed. And I didn't want to put Olor Dominicano, or Dominican broadly, or anything non region, non ancestry from Cuba. You know, I wanted to have something as close to a Cuban cigar as possible. So every plan, plan one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten that I was doing, uh, all had Liga, Liga Cubana one, Liga Cubana two, Liga Cubana three, one, 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 and Pinay de Rio, all of it. So when we, were, when we found the blends that, that we liked, the sun ground, the oscuro, we had no name. We didn't know what we call it. And my point is, so, so what are we going to call this? And uh, Leo was like, and I go to uh, Leo goes, oh, well, what don't you call it Pinay de Rio? <laughs> And I like, and I, go, I was like, well, it's probably already taken. And uh, and I hopped on the computer, and and it was not taken. It was dead. It was a dead. Somebody owned it at one point and let it die. And it's like, oh, we won't get the name. Do I let me, you know, pull out my credit card and I pay for it. Uh, uh, we paid for the for the registration, and next thing you know, uh, we got the trademark for Pinay de Rio. Wow. So Pinay de Rio. So that's the thing. The name coincides with. The cigar itself, because the seeds come from United Rio Cuba and grow in the Dominican Republic, and that's what we portray on our cigars. We come as close as possible to whatever uh, Cuban cigar could be developed by United. Is the 1878 that's on the band and on the boxes that have any relevance to anything? 1878 is the year where uh, United Rio was found. In okay. Cuba. Okay. So actually, if you look at the band itself, it's actually um, the Pinay de Rio shield and uh, with the 1870 on top of it and I just redesigned it uh, and developed a band around it okay. for Pinay de Rio. So everything I do, every blend that I, I put in, that I develop, always is going to have Havana because yeah. I want to have some sort of remnants of Pinay de Rio inside right. of it. Right. It wouldn't be Pinay de Rio if it doesn't have something from Pinay de Rio in it. So the classical has Habano binder and uh, and Habano with the fillers that was brought here, seeds grown in the, in the Republic of Navarrete and has ancestry from Pina de Rio. Obviously the, the Connecticut wrapper is not from Pina de Rio, obviously. Uh, but we come as close as possible to it.